How has music connected African Americans and China over the last century? My research starts at the beginning of the 20th century, so I can really start there. In the mid-20s, African-American jazz musicians, uh, particularly from the West Coast of the U.S., started going to Shanghai to play in the very opulent ballrooms that they had there. And um, they discovered that there was a great market for that music. The musicians who win or some of the, the top musicians, I would say, in the world. So some of the musicians coming out of Seattle, for example, were a part of the first Black music union in the country. And so they're from, some of them were from Garfield, the very famous Garfield High School. And they were very astute, very uh, steeped in the, not only the classical tr uh, tradition, but very good at jazz. They were there at the beginning of, of jazz. So they were extremely great musicians. They find that there's, a, there's some good work in Shanghai. And when they get there, they take over the music industry in that sense, because there's no one who's who's playing like them. There are other, you know, jazz bands in um, of uh, music, musicians, you know, working in Shanghai at the time, Filipino musicians, Japanese musicians, even Chinese musicians, right? But of course, the African-American musicians were, were, were very steep. This was their music. Jazz was their music. And it was taking the world by storm, right? Uh, uh, jazz music was one of the first global pop music in the world. So, um, and these were, you know, the the inventors. So you had people like Teddy Weatherford, who's uh, who played with Louis Armstrong in Chicago in the early 1920s. So you had some, and so the impact that it had on, on China was that Chinese musicians and musicians from around the world could sit and listen and learn from these jazz musicians. And a lot of them did, right? Um, whether that was going to the clubs where they were playing, some of them could go there, right? Um, or whether it was watching Hollywood movies because Hollywood movies were uh, one of the first talkies, check and double check featured Duke Ellington and his band in the movie, right? So even if some of these musicians, because of the racial hierarchy and imperialism, colonialism of the day, couldn't attend some of these opulent ballrooms, they could still hear the music at movie theaters where they did actually uh, notate some of this this music, right? Uh, we, we do have, have interviews from Chinese musicians who know for a fact that these musicians from the 20s and the 30s were like going into the movie theater and notating the jazz that they were hearing and trying to go back and play that in their nightclubs. But you also had African-American musicians who were playing in Chinese clubs and there they had to cater to the local taste and so they were learning how to play Chinese folk music, and they were sort of jazzifying that. And it worked really well because these folk musics were uh, based on the pentatonic scale, and jazz does quite well uh, with the pentatonic scale because it's also based on, you know, the blues and, and a folk music. So these musicians learned very quickly how to integrate Chinese folk music into their style of music. And that had a huge impact on the music scene there. Of course, jazz doesn't get to be played in China for a, a long period because when the Communist Party comes into power in uh, 1949, by, by 1954, they've basically shut down all these clubs and cabarets and it becomes illegal to play jazz, to own jazz, to have the records, to have the instruments, right? It's vilified as the old order. So essentially jazz is um, not in China for a long period of time from the mid fifties all the way until 1980. And in 1980, there's two African-American musicians, Willie Ruff and Dwight Mitchell, who are who were at the time the oldest jazz duo in the world. And Willie Ruff says in an interview when China first opened up in the, the 1980s that cultural groups were sending everybody to China, right? Ballet, um, American Philharmonic, uh, classical music. And he wanted to take jazz to China. And so he raised money. He learned how to speak Chinese and he spent six months learning Chinese so he can communicate with, with people uh, about jazz in Chinese, uh, which he did. It was very admirable for him to do that. 
And um, they had a, a master session at the Shanghai Conservatory of Music. And there's a video online where you can see them basically playing jazz. And one of the things that the students were really interested in was this idea of improvisation that you could improvise to to any song that you hadn't heard before. And so the, um, uh, Wooly Ruff and Dwight Mitchell, they basically proved it to them. They said, you know, let's have a Chinese student play a song we've never heard before, play it, we'll play it back, and then we'll improvise over it. And they did that. And the students were, were amazed. Again, this video is online, so you can see it. Um, but, you know, to improvise, uh, it takes a lot of skill. You just don't play notes. You have to understand scale patterns. You have to be able to play all these things in all 12 major keys, minor keys, you know, the other scales that they have. So it takes a lot of work to be able to improvise at a very high level. And um, that was what really interested students um, in jazz. But it still took, it took a long time even then for jazz to sort of uh, take hold in China again. So in the 1990s, you have uh, some young uh, musicians like Tui Jin, and they're playing with some American musicians who are there just having jam sessions in the, the 1990s. And they're learning, you know, starting to relearn the music, right? But if we fast forward to like 2000, I believe Wynton Marsalis came to China with his um, uh, Lincoln Center Orchestra. Kitty Garrett also spent some time in China and he was inspired and influenced by Chinese sounds. And he, he um, created an album called um, uh, The Great Wall or Around the Great Wall or something like that, where he was sort of reflecting back to Chinese people what his experience with Chinese music, right? And then you have a young trumpet uh, player named uh, Theo Croker, who's actually a Grammy-nominated trumpet player, who actually lived in Shanghai for several years, I think back in 2006, 2007, for a few years. And he still comes back and forth in China. So um, you do have uh, several musicians who are... Uh, still playing, you know, in that venue, right? And that helps bring new, fresh ideas of jazz, you know, into the the jazz community that's in Shanghai. Uh, and when I was living, I was in Shanghai in 2018, I was just amazed by the scene because every night at Jay-Z Club, it was packed in different audiences, right? You know, I mean, it's hard to find that in the U.S. right now where you can go into a jazz club and it's going to be packed, if you can find a jazz club, right? Um, but in Shanghai, I mean, every night I went, on weeknight, it's just packed with people. So that was really refreshing to see. How was jazz perceived in China in the 1980s once China started opening up to the world? Jazz would have been completely foreign for some of the younger people, right? But for some of the older people who still had memories of this going back to like the 40s, um, even the, the the early 50s, they would have remembered, you know, this music, right? Um, even though it was illegal to play uh, in China during uh, that period where they were closed off, I would imagine some people probably still snuck and played something or heard something, even if they were probably part of the elite. But in the 80s, it would be something completely, no pun intended, foreign to the average young person. It would be something new. One uh, historian, David Moser, who's, who's lived in China, because he was in Beijing at this time, and he told me that he felt that jazz was somehow seen as being kind of uh, subversive in a way. This was something else, another form of expression that was also tinged with with freedom, but was kind of under the radar as, as, as opposed to rock and roll. What were people-to-people -people interactions like between Black artists and Chinese locals? If we're going back to the 20s and 30s, I believe that the African-American musicians, I mean, had a really a good time in China. Um, they were making a lot more money than they could make in the U.S. And this was... Um, and this was um, during the, the Great Depression, right? So they were making a substantial amount of money that provided a certain kind of lifestyle uh, where they were having their clothes tailored, eating the best food. I mean, yes, they were in Shanghai, and Shanghai is a, a was a, a semi-colonial space where there was still this rigid sort of racial hierarchy that was there. 
but they were still um, because of you know their income, um, because of the international aspect of, of Shanghai, uh, I think most of them really felt free. Um, there is one musician, Teddy Weatherford, he was interviewed and one person asked him, um, and, you know, Teddy Weatherford was this, you know, very tall man for the for the period. He was like 6'1", 6'2". He used to wear these white um, suits, you know, donning a white hat. So he was, you know, you couldn't miss him, you know, and he was very like a uh, dark skinned black man. And uh, so one interviewer reportedly asked him, um, well, you know, how are you treated? You know, how are things life in, you know, in Asia? And uh, his response was, they treat us white folks just fine. That had to be how good it was to be a, a jazz musician in Shanghai at that time, that he would make a statement like that, you know. Even up until the start of um, World War II in China in 1937, I mean, half the musicians went home because they sort of saw the writing on the wall that, you know, things were becoming more violent. Um, the Japanese bombed part of uh, Shanghai and there some of the musicians left. But uh, there were several African-American musicians who did not leave. Uh, they did not leave Shanghai. They stayed. Um, and, and many of them ended up in like Japanese internment camps. But uh, the fact that they were more willing to uh, deal with the prospects of war than to go back to America uh, says a lot about what America was like then, right? And a lot about you know, the environment in China. Um, so there's not much in the archive about one-to-one -one relationships with Chinese and African-American artists. We do have information about like Japanese artists and Japanese people and Europeans um, intermingling. And we have pictures, you know, of them hanging out together and, and things like that. Uh, we don't see the the Chinese. And, and that may have something to do with language barrier. Uh, it may have something to do as well uh, with a, a tinge of maybe uh, some anti-Blackness and, you know, who wants to, you know, get to know or befriend Black people. Um, for the common person, I mean, you know, uh, one of the musicians, Buck Clayton, writes very warmly about Chinese people and his interaction with, with Chinese people um, and the experience they had in China. But I can't say that I've seen um, evidence that there were like strong relationships in the same way that there were strong relationships between African Americans and Filipino musicians or Russian musicians or uh, Japanese musicians, right? Um, they were listening, but uh, um, were they becoming, you know, bandmates and friends with uh, uh, the African American musicians? There is no evidence uh, to, that shows that at this particular point, right? 80s um, and the 90s. Um, I think musicians in general um, are treated, you know, because of their special talent are, are treated a certain kind of way, right? By popular society, right? But there is some unevenness when it comes to how regular, everyday, ordinary, like black people are treated in China versus um, uh, other groups of people like, you know, white students. So in China, there were sort of anti-black riots in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. I mean, four months before Tiananmen Square, uh, before Chinese students were talking about democracy and science and freedom, um, in Nanjing and other parts of the country, they were saying, you know, Black students should go home. There's something else there, right? And I'm still researching this and trying to sort of peg down um, the beginning and this sort of like bias towards uh, Blackness. And when I say Blackness, I mean sort of a darker skin tone, right? And in some ways that that white students don't have that same experience yet. Yes, they're a foreigner. Yes, they're considered non-Chinese, but the tropes surrounding whiteness are very different than the tropes that um, the Chinese have in general for Black people. And again, these things are shifting and changing in the 21st century, as a lot of Chinese students who have studied in America have, you know, Black teachers and Black friends. But if you were to talk to their parents, they would probably be a different, a, a different story, right? But these things are still present, right? These things are still present in China.
and it does have an impact on Black students who go there.